Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together. Morning, everyone. Was the rain good last night? Yeah. Car wash, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Well, I've got to tell you, I'm so enjoying this camp meeting. It's, it's really nice. It's good to be here. Meeting friends from a long time ago and uh, meeting new friends as well. It's, it's really nice. So many connections with Canadians and Australians. Um, one of the connections, I guess, an interest that I have is particularly in World War I. My grandfather was in World War I, and of course, so were a lot of Canadians. And the thing that really touched me enormously was reading about a Canadian battalion that was on the Western Front, and the, the men there, for 17 days, didn't have an opportunity to take their boots off. For 17 days, they were on the front trenches, and um, incredibly resilient, strong, resourceful young men in the prime of their lives. And you think, if they didn't have time to take their boots off in 17 days, the intensity of the, the activity, just how much rest did they get, you know? And they, they actually learnt from it, and they never repeated it again, because it, it damaged the men to such an extent. So, Canadians, Australians, it's, it's nice to have that connection. And I'd like to thank Pastor David Ripley as well, once again for the invitation to be here, love camp meetings, and I particularly love this slot in the day. If you're asking me, this is the best time of the day. You know, like, this is when we're at our sharpest, when we can do the best Bible study, um, we're not falling asleep so much. It's, this is the prime time. Pastor Ripley, thank you. It's really appreciated. And I've been enjoying the meals as well. The food here is good. You Canadians can cook. It's good. So um, that's, that's lovely as well. Now, this morning, we're going to be exploring a little more about Jesus and discipleship. And this morning, we're going to be looking at perhaps one of the greatest hindrances to discipleship, and that is fear. Dealing with fear as a disciple. And so if I was to give this morning's topic a, a title, it would be from fear to ecstasy. From fear to ecstasy. This morning we're going to be looking primarily at Mark's Gospel. The second gospel in the New Testament, but most likely the first one that was written. And I'd like to just share a, an overview of Mark, just to, just to introduce it so that we can exactly see where Mark is going. Now we know that John Mark was the author in the Adventist Bible Dictionary. It shares with us there a, a traditional story that Mark and his family actually owned the upper room in Jerusalem. So when Jesus celebrated the, the foot washing service and so forth, the Passover with his disciples, it was most likely in a room owned by John Mark and his family. As we were reminded yesterday, Mark abandoned that missionary journey and uh, he was restored and uh, cared for by his cousin, Barnabas, and um, we also know that Mark was the first gospel written, and he invented a new form of genre, a new form of literature, when he wrote the gospel of Mark, a creative young man who told the story of Jesus in a new way. In many respects, I think this is as important as the person who invented television or radio, because it was a new format 
of communicating the story of Jesus with, with the people. Now, um, we know that Mark's gospel was the basis of Matthew and Luke's gospel. And those three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what do we call those three gospels? The synoptic. And the synoptic comes from two Greek words. Optic, which means to see, and syn, S-Y-N, where we get the English synergy, synchronize, and so forth, means together. So it literally means seeing together. That's synoptic. Another detail about um, Mark's gospel is how quickly everything happens. If you're reading in the King James, it'll have the, the term straightway. If you're reading in more contemporary translations, it'll be immediately. Immediately. You'll see this time and time again in Mark's gospel. He's in a hurry to tell us about Jesus. Mark's gospel, of course, is the shortest of the gospels, and it can be comfortably read in one sitting. If you've never done it, mark out just a little time and sit down and read all of Mark's gospel without an interruption. It's a lovely experience. And if you've got a red-lettered edition of the Bible, where the literal words of Jesus are recorded for us, if you read those together, it takes 20 minutes from Mark's gospel. And there's a message in that in itself. It's as though Mark is saying, to discover Jesus, to experience eternity, just listen to 20 minutes of Jesus and you'll be changed, transformed, all part of discipleship. Um, so Mark tells his story very quickly. Let, let me just demonstrate this to you and demonstrate the emphasis that Mark has in his gospel. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1 and verse 1 and keep your finger there in the page and turn across to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and the last verse of Mark chapter 10. I'm sorry, um, yeah, Mark chapter, Mark 1, verse 1, keep your finger there and turn to Mark chapter 10 and verse 52. Now in those pages that you hold there, that is the first 33 years of Jesus' life. The first 33 years. The rest of the book, all the way from the start of chapter 11, right through to the end of Mark's gospel, to chapter, the end of chapter 16, is basically the last week of Jesus' life. Can you see what's happening here? Mark, with the urgency of telling his story and the immediacy of it, goes through the first 33 years very, very quickly, capturing the high points. But the closer we get to the cross, the more he slows the story down. Have you ever taken a long train journey on a train with lots of carriages? Do you call them carriages here? Cars, Cars? okay. When you're coming into a station in one of those big, long passenger trains... Does the train just stop like that? No. no. It comes to a, a gradual stop and you can barely feel it when the train has come to a stop. Yeah. And Mark does the same with the gospel, his gospel. He brings us right to the cross of Jesus and he wants us to stop there pause and consider what's happening on that cross. You know, if we look at Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, it's a short verse, 
but every word. And you know, when you, when you have such a concise message here in the Gospel of Mark, every word, every phrase is carefully picked. There's, there's no extra baggage. Everything is very significant. So just looking at this first verse here, it says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that little verse says so much. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Four important, at least four important points there in just those few words. Gospel. Gospel. What does gospel mean? Gospel was a, comes from the Greek word euangelion. It's a borrowed word. It's a word that the Christians borrowed from the secular Greeks. The secular Greeks used the word gospel or euangelion, good news, in this context. When there was a battle, a messenger would be sent back to Athens and the people of Athens would be waiting to hear one word from the messenger. This is where we get the marathon runner from. And if the messenger only had to say one word, and the word was euangelion, good news, gospel. And what did that mean? It meant there has been a battle. The fighting was intense. We have the victory, and now there is peace. And this is what the message of the gospel is all about. No wonder the Christians thought, we're going to have that. And they took it, and they used that Greek word, euangelion. And this is how Mark begins his gospel, the good news. The good news about Jesus. And that word Jesus, that says so much. But it doesn't just call him Jesus, it calls him Jesus Christ. Now it's very easy to think that Christ is just like a surname. Jesus Christ, like Mary Christ, his mother, or Joseph Christ, his father. It wasn't a surname, it's a title. It means Messiah anointed one. It's telling us more about the identity of this Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. And then he saves the most important point to last, the Son of God. The Son of God. And this, this verse is like a summary of the whole of Mark's gospel. The good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And it's the purpose of Mark is to show evidence that Jesus, the Messiah, is the Son of Man and also the Son of God. It emphasizes his identity, his authority, the credibility of Jesus. And then Mark plays a game almost with his audience. The, the kid's book, do you have Where's Waldo or Where's Wally? Which one do you have here? Waldo? Yeah. Ah, so you follow America, the United States. It was actually authored first in the UK and it was Where's Wally? And the North Americans adapted it. They thought Waldo was a better name than Wally. So, um, and, and, and who's, who's Waldo? What does Waldo look like in this children's story? It's not really a story. It's a, it's a picture book. And Waldo is this very skinny man wearing a what color sweater? Red and white striped. And we, in Australia, we call it a beanie. You know, a woolen tack-on kind of to keep your head warm when it's cold. A toque. 
Well, you learn something every day, don't you? All right. Thanks for increasing my vocabulary. A toque. All right. Oh, it's French. And what does the French actually mean? Warm hat. Okay. Yeah. All right. A toque. All right. So he's wearing a red and white striped toque. And in these pictures, for those that don't know, the, the game is who can spot Waldo first? Because there's a lot of things there in the pictures and who can spot him first? And Mark plays a game in his gospel of who can identify Jesus as the Son of God first? Who would you think? Would it be a child, a disciple, perhaps a priest, Peter, maybe Andrew, maybe John? Well, it's a surprise who identifies Jesus as the Son of God first. When we look through his gospel, there is the voice from heaven on two occasions in Mark's gospel. When he was baptized, in Mark chapter 1, verse 11, this is my son, do you remember it says, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. You are my son, the son of God. So a voice from heaven is first to identify in that context. But who is going to be the first human? When Jesus comes to a demoniac, the demonic voice speaking through the person calls Jesus the Son of God, but that's not coming from the person, that's coming from the evil one. Who is the first person? Do you want to know? Mm, I'm eager to tell you too. Turn with me across to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. And notice with me verse 37. This is where Mark wants to bring every reader. With a loud cry, this is Mark chapter 15, verse 37. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Verse 38. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And here's verse 39. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus, heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. The centurion was the first person to identify Jesus as the Son of God. Now when we think of Roman centurions... If you've seen some old Hollywood movie or something like that, we think of the centurions with their, their cool armoured uniform and that helmet with the, the furry bit that runs across the top. It looks very nice and charming. Don't be fooled. Centurions were ruthless, mean, tough, hard men. They had to keep a hundred Roman killing machines in order, under control. A Roman soldier, there was nothing warm and fuzzy about a Roman soldier. A Roman soldier was a ruthless killer. This was the iron monarchy of Rome. They specialised in control, in murder, in death. And for a centurion... To have the wherewithal to keep a hundred of these controllable people together. You've heard of the phrase herding cats? Yeah. Try keeping a hundred killers under control and not turning on themselves, not turning on you, but keep them fighting in the right way 24 7. A centurion was a tough, hard man. And it was this centurion that Mark has standing there in front of the cross of Jesus, listening to what he had to say, 
seeing the kind of man that Jesus was. And as he died, he said, surely this man is the Son of God. This is the power of the gospel that can transform people. Don't ever think, don't ever be tempted by the evil one to think that somebody can't be changed. If God can transform a person like a centurion to have a heart that opens up to Jesus Christ, the gospel can transform anyone. Anyone can be a disciple of Jesus. This is the power of Jesus Christ. This is the power of his life. This is the power of his death. This is the power of his resurrection, the power of his ascension, the power of his return. This is the power of his word. Don't ever be tempted. This is Jesus. There's more in the Gospel of Mark that I want to look at. I got a bit worked up there, folks. That was just the introduction. I'd like you to come back with me to Mark chapter 5 now. Because although Mark moves briefly and quickly through that first 33 years of Jesus' life, there's important things that we need to capture along the way. I wish we could have more time to look at more stuff, but let's, let's just look at Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> And before we get into Mark chapter 5, let's look at the closing scenes of Mark chapter 4, because that's important in setting the context for Mark chapter 5. You remember that Jesus wanted to go across to the other side of the Sea of Tiberias or the, or the other side of the, the, the Lake of Galilee. And he got into a boat and he was sound asleep, sleeping on a cushion in the stern, Mark says. And the storm blew up, a violent squall. And water was coming into the boat. And the disciples, they said something to Jesus. They said, this is in verse 37, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? As Jesus is right, sleeping very peacefully. Verse 39, this is Mark chapter 4, verse 39, Mark writes, he got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. You know, when you look at what he actually says here, the Greek word, if you literally translate it, it means, I hope you're not offended by this, it literally means shut up. Shut up. Say nothing. Stop speaking. And then there's the second emphasis there. You'll notice where it's translated, quiet, be still. The second word that's translated into New English as be still means to muzzle, literally in the Greek, to muzzle. So it's shut up and shut your mouth that Jesus is saying to the elements. Jesus didn't like being woken up, did he? Okay. So shut up and be quiet. And you'll notice here, as you, as you read through this, this passage, the disciples, they were not afraid of the squall. They were not afraid when the water was coming in. They said, don't you care if we drown? But there was no expression of fear. It was more, can you help us bail the water out? Was their, their pleading. But then notice, verse 40, immediately after everything became absolutely calm at the moment that Jesus spoke, notice verses 40 and 41. He said to, this, to, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid. You notice here he's not saying, why were you so afraid? It's present tense. Now that it's calm, now that it's still, Jesus says to them, 
Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And verse 41 says, They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Can you see when the disciples were afraid here? They weren't afraid of the storm. They were more afraid of the power of Jesus. That was the scary thing. This person, who is he that can still a storm? And we can imagine how it was roaring around, how the boat was rocking, how water was coming in, and then instantly it becomes calm. And what do you hear? You just hear the gentle lap of a becalmed boat on a completely placid pond. And then Jesus says to them, Why are you afraid? And they are terrified. Who is this? And that question there, who is this, is the central question in Mark's gospel. Who is this? And that's what we want to discover. He says, do you still have no faith? They couldn't even get out. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, totally controlled by fear. There was no awe or respect. It was terror. Now, if we come through then into Mark chapter 5 itself, we have, they crossed the lake to the region of the Gerasenes in Mark chapter 5 and verse 1. Now, the Gerasenes, that was the other side. The western side of the Sea of Galilee was Jewish. It's part of Israel. The eastern side of the sea, Gentile. Completely different. And so he arrives over there, and um, when he arrives there, He's in the area, what we call today, of most likely of Umkais, which was part of the Decapolis. And notice what happens when he arrives. In Mark chapter 5 and verse 2, we read, When Jesus got out of the boat, so this is on the eastern side, on the Gentile side, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs. And no one can bind, could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he often had been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. It's not a pretty picture, is it? According to Mark, this is Jesus' first journey of ministry to the Gentiles. And notice who's there to welcome him. You know, when a dignitary makes a trip to a foreign country and they arrive, how are they normally greeted? Yeah, like dignitaries. What colour's the carpet? Red. All right. The red carpet's rolled out. There's normally military and highly polished brass bands. Everything sparkles, everything's right. A flyover, isn't that right? The Son of God is making a visit. He's a true dignitary. And who's there to meet him and to welcome him? The devil. The devil. It's scary stuff. A truly frightening individual, a man who's controlled by undiluted evil, who lived his life with the dead. No one previously was a match for this man in his strength. No chain, no iron chain. Remember, this was in the Roman, 
Remember the legs of iron of Daniel 2? This was in the Roman toughest, hardest era. No Roman iron chain could bind this man. Day and night, he's running around screaming. He's cutting himself with stones. And I can imagine those cuts being infected as well. Everything about this individual is truly frightening. And he comes running at Jesus. I can remember one dark night, I had to wait in a lonely car park, seated in my car. And I saw a distant figure running. And he was running towards my car. And I was sitting there in my car, and I was scared. Because this guy, he had a hood over his head. I didn't know who he was or what it was. Just running in my direction. And I'm sitting there waiting in the car, and I've got to tell you, My prayer life has never been so good. And I was praying. I made sure every window was up and every door was locked. And he ran past the car. But it's scary when somebody runs in your direction and you don't know what's going on. This guy, with that description that we've had, the internal description as well as the external and his manner, his state of mind... He comes running at Jesus. It's fearful. Notice what happens. Verses 6 and 7. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? This is another demon identifying Jesus and Jesus' identity. Swear to God that you won't torture me. Now there's a a high recognition and understanding of Jesus' identity here. This demon, as we'll find out, these multiple demons, they knew the identity of Jesus, but they had no clue on his character. Torture? Jesus isn't into torture. As we discover here, this demon or these demons beg Jesus. And as we look through here, we're going to see a lot of fear and we're going to see a lot of begging. Begging in desperation. They fear Jesus because of his power as the Son of God, not because of his nastiness. And as we know, they beg to be able to enter into 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of pigs, 2,000 of them. And they fill these pigs. You know the story. Those 2,000 pigs go charging down the hill. And they go into the, the sea. You imagine, you know the sound that a horse makes? One horse, he can hear it. 2,000 pigs running down, that's 8,000 trotters tearing down that hill, the sound that that would be making. And I'm yet to see my first skinny pig. You know, there's a, there's a lot of weight behind each one of those trotters as it hits the ground. And then they hit into the, the water. There's not only the sound and the churning up of the sea as they're drowning, but what sound does a pig make when it's in trouble? Whew. 2,000 pigs screaming. When an animal screams, it can make a noise. Let me tell you a quick story. My wife and I, we were moving and we arrived in this new place. It was a small country town, 4,000 people. And we'd spent the day carrying and lifting and emptying boxes. You know what it's like when you move. And it had been a long day and it was summertime and it was hot and we'd perspired. Just had a shower. Then we were looking around. Where's the sheets for the bed? Which box is that in? Find the sheets, make the bed. And we just lie back in bed after a day like that. Just absolutely exhausted. And then out of the bedroom window, 
we hear these screaming, unbelievable sound. I thought, oh no, what's going on out there? What neighbourhood have we moved into? And I went out there and here are all the neighbours standing around this tree. Some are there with garden hoses, with torches, flashlights, pointing up into the tree. And there are two koala bears. And they were fighting. Two males. And one was stronger than the other. And the stronger one would clamour across this gum tree from one side to the other, belt up the other male koala, and that one was screaming its head off. And then it'd run back to the other side. But an animal screaming... You can imagine these 2,000 pigs. That's what a koala can do. You know, that's a cuddly, fluffy thing. 2,000 pigs. You can imagine the commotion. This legion of demons that's gone into these pigs. The turmoil. Mark 4. Mark, sorry, Mark chapter 5, verse 14. It says, Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind. And what does the Bible say next? And they were afraid. There's no mention of them being afraid of the man when he was demon-possessed, even by a legion. No mention of fear. But now, when they see him, all cleaned up, with clothes on, in his right mind, that's scary. In the same way, the disciples, they weren't scared of the storm. They were scared of the calm after it, after Jesus had worked the miracle. You know, people are scared of a lot of things. People are scared of snakes, spiders. You know, what possesses a person to make a rubber snake? They are just invented to frighten people, aren't they? I don't like those things at all. People are scared of sharks. People are scared of heights. People are scared of closed in spaces, big spaces. People can be afraid of a lot of things. People can be afraid of Jesus. Now, why are people afraid of Jesus? It's not because of the demands of him telling us what to eat, what to do, keeping Sabbath. I don't think that frightens people. What frightens people about Jesus is that when you follow Jesus, you are no longer in control of your own life. As a disciple of Jesus, who's in control of your life? Jesus. And that is scary. That's like sitting in a driverless car. You know one of these new cars that they're inventing? We, in a sense, and in a sense, you can't see the driver at the wheel. In a sense, we can't see Jesus as he's leading us and discipling us. And so it's a fearful thing to put Jesus in control of our lives. People are scared of that. And if I'm really honest, there are times when I'm afraid of what Jesus will ask me to do. Because often Jesus asks a lot of us that we think we can't do. But he never asks us to do anything that we can't do. It's a growing experience this whole experience of discipleship. 
Yeah, it can be frightening, but it grows us and makes us and makes us stronger. It makes us better. It rounds us out as a person. We're not quite finished with this man, this healed man, this exercised man of a legion. Desire of Ages, page 338, describes him. Well, she actually describes the, the, the pair of demoniacs from Matthew chapter 8, but it's the same description. She writes, Meanwhile, a marvellous change had come over the demoniac. Light had shone into his mind. His eyes beamed with intelligence. His countenance, so long deformed by the image of Satan, suddenly became mild. The blood-stained hands were quiet and with glad voice the man praised God for his deliverance. And that's what people were afraid of when they saw that. Now, this man, as verse 18 tells us, let's just look at, this is Mark chapter 5, verse 18. It says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, so Jesus was going to leave the Gentile side and go back. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus didn't let him, but said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis. That's 10 cities. In 10 cities, how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. This man begs Jesus, a legion of demons begged Jesus, and Jesus said, yes, you can go into the pigs. This man begs Jesus, can I come with you in the boat and follow you? It's not as though it was an airfare on a plane, on a big... It was just another seat in a boat where there was probably plenty of room. And Jesus said, no. And he's told to go home to his family to the people who are now afraid of him. Think about that. Go home to the people who are afraid of him and tell them what the Lord has done for you. Sometimes the call of discipleship is tough. And you know, Ellen White, she has something to say about this as well. She makes the point that this guy had not heard one sermon from the lips of Jesus. Not one sermon. This guy had not studied one day of his Sabbath school lesson. And Jesus tells him to go home to his family and friends and be an evangelist. Wow. Wow. And what this man does, he doesn't just go home to his family and friends, he goes to ten cities. Now, if I can be really honest about my fears at the moment, I've got a bachelor in theology, I've got a master's in theology, and I'm working on a PhD in theology. I've got 30 years' experience in ministry, and 20 years of that was as a public evangelist, as a division evangelist. But you know what frightens me? Being sent to a city to evangelize it. Anthony? Go to that city and turn all of those non-believers into believers. Me, Lord? I'm just this Australian kid from a bush town. What can I do? But here was this man. Hadn't heard a sermon from Jesus. But he experienced Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus. And what God could do with him. And ten cities were amazed by him. And if I didn't say this before, in Mark's gospel, this is the first Christian evangelist. Praise God. What can we do? What can we do if we step away from our fears? 
I know what it's like. It's a frightening, fearful thing to talk to friends about Jesus because we're afraid that we'll lose them as friends. True? Yeah. We can invest a lot of time in connecting with people, but we're afraid to speak to them about the love of Jesus and about what Jesus has done for us because we're controlled by fear. As a disciple of Jesus, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Mark's got another lesson for us. Our time's running away. Let's cover this briefly. The next story in Mark chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large, so he's back on the Jewish side. So he's left the Gentile side. He's left the side where the pigs were. And he's coming back to the Jewish side, the western side. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers, I was hoping to make a joke there about pork and synagogue. Did you know that? Okay, so he's back on the synagogue side with the Jews. Mark makes it very clear. A synagogue ruler named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come, put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So here's this man synagogue ruler. He comes to Jesus, desperate. He's got a 12-year-old little girl at home, and the door of death is opening for that little girl, and he's worried. He comes to Jesus begging. This man was a man who was a ruler, a synagogue ruler, and he comes to Jesus And notice how he approaches Jesus. He even tells Jesus how to heal his daughter. Do you notice that? Come, put your hands on her. He's even telling Jesus how to heal her. Let's not be too harsh on this man because we often do the same thing with our prayers. When we pray, we often tell God how to answer our prayers. And at times, God has a better answer than we can ever imagine. So this man comes telling Jesus how to heal his daughter. Okay. But as Jesus, we know that as Jesus is making his way through the crowd... He feels a touch. And the touch comes from who? A woman. A woman with a a terrible medical condition who is absolutely desperate. For 12 years, she'd struggled with this. And during that 12 years, no matter what doctor she went to, things only got worse. Twelve years is a long time to be in decline, to live with that day by day and only going downhill. In desperation, she touches Jesus, and in her faith, she is healed. And the instant she is healed, Jesus stops and he says, who touched me? Who was it? And for years, I've wrestled with this story, and I've thought... Jesus, don't you know about patient-doctor confidentiality? (laughs) Is this something that you really want brought out in public? Just, Just leave this lady and her illness alone. But then Ellen White gave me an insight, which I'm really appreciative of. She talks about how if we've received a blessing, a gift from God... We can't keep silent about it. We can't receive the gifts of God in silence and in secret. 
were to share those gifts of God and proclaim them. And this woman, and after 30 years of marriage, folks, I've learnt this. I've learnt that typically women have wonderful memories. Really good memories. I've got to be feeling pretty stupid to start an argument with my wife. Because stuff that I've forgotten long ago, she can just bring back, boom, boom, boom. And she wipes the floor with me. And when you look at this, Jesus asks this, who touched me? And notice what comes next. Verse 33, this is Mark chapter 33. Then the woman, knowing what had happened, happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear. Notice when she's afraid. She's afraid after she's healed. Told him the whole truth. A 12-year story. If you're going to tell the whole truth, 12 years of illness, it's not going to be a short story. Remembering all the details. And she's going through it, detail by detail. Now, can you picture Jairus? What does Jairus want? I've got a 12-year-old daughter at home. He's thinking, she's dying. And this, as lovely as this woman is, she is going on and on and on. Please, Lord, please. And there's something beautiful about daughters. I think I've mentioned my wife and I, we've got two lovely daughters. And there's something just... When a little girl holds their father's hand and those soft little hands go into a father's hand, I tell you, the father feels 10 feet tall. There's something beautiful about those little hands when they hold a a father's hand little girl's hair, the curls and the ribbons and the bows, the little dresses and things that you can put on a girl, or the jeans or whatever you want, but there's just something sweet about little girls. And the father with his little girl at home, please, Lord, please come. Just put your hands on her and heal her. And then while he's waiting for this woman to finish this long 12-year-long story with all the truth, the whole story, Jairus gets a message. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter is dead. And Jairus dissolves. Sometimes some things happen in life where we're not just driven to the Bible, we're driven to our knees. And that's when God can work with us. Jairus is driven to his knees, and for the first time, Jesus speaks to them. And notice what Jesus says. This is in Mark chapter 5 and verse 36. Jesus told the synagogue ruler, what did he tell him? Don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. And Jesus goes home with Jairus. He gets there and there's a commotion. And Jesus tells the commotion that's weeping and wailing. She's not dead. She's what? She's sleeping. And he takes Peter, James and John his closest disciples, and he takes Jairus, the father, and the little girl's mother, and they go in to this little girl where she was lying, and Jesus takes takes her by the hand, and she rises. You know, at times, we pray for a healing, and God wants to give us a resurrection. At times we pray for things and our prayers aren't big enough. 
as a disciple of Jesus. Sometimes we need to let Jesus do the praying. Oh, we're praying. But our prayers need to be open. And then notice, after this little girl is healed, verse 42, this is Mark chapter 5, verse 42. This is one of Mark's immediately or straight away. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12, year, 12 years old. At this there was complete, they were completely astonished. Now the, the word here for astonish is the Greek word ecstasis. And ecstasis is where we get the English word ecstasy. This whole lead up, the disciples in a boat with Jesus, the storm, it calms, they're afraid after the calm comes. The demon-possessed man, all that happens with the demon-possessed possession, he's healed of that and then there's fear. The woman, healed from her 12 years of illness, when she's healed, then she's afraid. But this time, when the healing occurs, there is no fear. There's ecstasy. And this, this is the journey that Jesus wants to take us on. From fear to ecstasy. And this is the walk of discipleship. One of the most frightening things in life is to follow Jesus. But the ultimate destination of discipleship is not fear, it's ecstasy. It's a resurrection. It's ecstasy. This is the walk of discipleship. God bless you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you that Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, with the gospel, the good news, brings his disciples ecstasy. Lord, take fear from us as we commit our lives to you, as we give you total control of our lives. Take our fears and Lord, help us to pray big prayers. Help us not to limit you and what you can do. But Lord, we pray for that ultimate resurrection and ecstasy. In Jesus' name, amen. Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together.